as everybody know by now, Muhammad Ali passed away. And it, to me, it been interesting to see the media coverage of him and people who say they just admired him so much. And because, because you know, it like a lot of conservatives say how much they admire him, and it's crazy to me because the statements that he said, y'all would hate him. Because if people would say what Muhammad Ali said back then, he'll be outcast as a radical, a radical, racist, blah blah blah. You know how it goes, but everybody loves mm-hmm. Muhammad Ali now, so. It's it just interesting to see that to me. And it looks like they're going to try to MLK his legacy. So that's what we got to watch for because, um, you know, it took a long time for them to pass Martin Luther King's birthday as a holiday. Ronald Reagan was against it, and it finally passed with pressure. John McCain was against it. I think he voted against it, you know, because um, back then he was still considered a, a radical. Like he wasn't pop. Martin Luther King was not popular amongst the, mas- the masses when he died you know they felt like he was a radical and all that stuff but now let everybody tell it they all love Martin Luther King too so it just it's it just interesting to see so I want to start off with that part of um, Muhammad Ali and the fact that Bill Clinton is speaking at his funeral so I, I'll start with you Mikhail first on this because we had to stop you from unloading your round last show so <laughs> I'll send you this question first. Let it go. go ahead, brother. I mean, I'm not going to fire off too many. Sh- I ain't going to fire off too much. It's it's just ironic. You know what I mean? First off, we have a man who has this this ghetto past for life, um, falsified past based on him being some first black president. And the qualifications that we allowed for him to be the first black president is the fact that he smoked weed and he cheated on his wife. Mm. So it wasn't proud black people that gave him. It wasn't proud black people who gave him this pass. It was a bunch of niggas doing nigga shit to give him a pass. Excuse my language. Because the standards for black people, people who just smoke weed and are partaking in infidelity, breaking up their families, that is not us. I already mentioned earlier about him being the governor of Arkansas and the airports that went through his state were one of the main ports in which drugs was being flown in and distributed throughout inner cities throughout America. Not to mention him in alignment with privatized prisons to mass incarcerate young black men. And in many cases, young black women as well. This devastated our community. So now how do you then turn and have him give a eulogy, a speech, on this BS ghetto pad that you gave this I want to say a lot of names. I'm not going to do that because you got to mature. You got to be better than that. (laughs) I'm just going to say this dude. We'll leave it at that. How are you going to let this dude speak on a international proud black symbol? Now, this is the part why I I said I'm not totally against symbolism because sometimes you need symbolism, especially if that symbol for your pride was someone who literally things who ride for his people. This is a man, Muhammad Ali, who lost everything, lost title, lost his money. And, of course, the same community now who love him did not have his back like that back then when he was losing money. He said he was so broke he had to break penny ba- piggy banks up at his mama house. To keep the doors open And nobody wanted to support him Everybody distanced himself from him for a time And then others st- Began to Stand by him like Kareem Abdul-Jabbar Those type of athletes they began to stand with him 
But at the, when he first originally was against the war, before white America got against the war, most of these, most of these Negroes was distancing themselves from him. And he sacrificed his career. Something these niggas won't sacrifice a check from Sprite. These Negroes won't sacrifice a check from McDonald's to stand for their people. So this is a symbol for us. This is our warrior, our hero. And you will let someone who was the centerpiece of mass incarceration of young black people give a eulogy at one of our heroes' wake? One of our heroes' uh, funeral, excuse me? How would anyone feel if it was a Jew that went to Adolf Hitler's funeral? Because he was their hero. The Germans. Or some Jewish rabbi died and a German went and did the funeral for him. For him. But this is what we allow. Nigger stuff. How can we let that happen? How can that ride? I was looking at the funeral earlier. They got all type of nonsense going on. Nobody wants to talk about the most honorable Elijah Muhammad, who was his teacher. Right, wrong, indifferent, whether you agree with all his decisions or not. It was the nation of Islam that made Muhammad Ali. Don't nobody want to talk about that. Nobody even wants to mention that. You want to take all the black away from him, all the black and proud away from him. And it's symbolic of what's happening to us in America today. We've become such powers, such violent powers, that we will let something like that ride? I wouldn't even attend the damn funeral. If I was some of these athletes, some of these entertainers, I would have boycotted it. Because as an entertainer, he should be the, the, the apex example for who you should inspire to be as it pertains to dealing with politics, socially, economically. As an entertainer, you owe a responsibility to the community from which you came. Muhammad Ali showed you how to sacrifice yourself to do so. He should be your hero. He should be everybody's hero. He was ours. And today, we let them take him from us, just like they took King from us, just like they took Malcolm from us. And now these are so-called humanitarians now. Muhammad Ali called the white man the devil. Now, I don't believe in no devil or no God or anything like that, but he called them the, he called them the devil. And it was a diametric opposing stance against white supremacy because he knew he was winning gold for the U.S. but then would come home and couldn't get a cup of coffee at a bar. Couldn't drink water but he's out there fighting as an American winning gold for the U.S. He said once he found that out he took his gold medal and threw it in the lake. Hmm. So how would you allow a man who was governor and watched drugs come through his airport and devastate our community to the point we ain't even recovered from that today. We ain't recovered from that today. Before the crack epidemic, before the crack epidemic, single parent homes was at 24%. After the crack epidemic, it raised all the way to 72%. Mm. Crack cocaine played an integral part in that. And this beast was the governor, centerpiece of making sure that happened. How can he stand and give a eulogy at one of our heroes' funerals? Wow. So we should be looking at this as a black eye right now, as a nation. We're powerless here. And because we're powerless, we become cowards. How can we let something like that go? I'm done. I dropped Mike right there. Wow. <laughs> Miss Baba, want to follow that I up? I don't even want to say anything after that because Mikael just summed it up. Um, the only thing I will add real quick is just, um, I just feel like this. Bill Clinton giving the eulogy at Muhammad Ali's funeral is just as bad as them referring to him as Cassius Clay. Like, how do you allow things to occur knowing that the man, the very epitome of who and what Muhammad Ali was, didn't stand for either of those things. You know, so I, it's just, 
I don't even understand. Just as Mikael stated, I just don't even understand how, who, like, who allowed that? Who gave, who gave him that that job to do? And who said that that would like who okayed that? That I, that's what I really want to know. Like, how did that even go down? Oh no, um, they trying to say that they were friends later, but like I I don't know. Older I Lee Lee when he had Parkinson's, I I I don't know, man. But it just mm-hmm. it just like we were saying earlier, they whitewash and they just kind of take over the legacies of great people. Um, they want to do with everybody like. Um, Harriet Tubman. They talk about Harriet Tubman, but they don't even really talk about the real with her. Um, same thing with, same thing with MLK. Um, same thing with a lot of our leaders, and they just continuously do this. So I don't know. Get, I mean, to I mean, what we standing at right now, we looking at a, we looking at a place where in twenty years there's gonna be a white man playing Muhammad Ali in a movie. That's what we <sighs> head toward. Well, it's gonna be an Arab. It's gonna be a, it's gonna be a white Arab playing Muhammad Ali in a movie. That's what we headed toward. Well, they already starting to whitewash the the history right now. I forgot which reporter said it, but one of these reporters said that Muhammad Ali was beyond race. Like, like oh, really? Oh <laughs> yeah, I have that here. It actually yeah, you it heard was, that um, Chris Myers. It was Chris Myers, and he said this is his quote verbatim from um Twitter. He said when you saw when you saw Ali, you didn't see color, you didn't see religion. You saw a gentleman who was a strong fighter, a champion. You could believe in. That's it. those wow. are, those are his exact words. <laughs> what a joke. That's and, why uh, I'm laughing. When did he see joke. him? Did he see him when he was telling the uh US government, You my enemy? Exactly. Was he, did and he see him the, then? That's the problem. Because you can't I can't be great to you unless you Unless you accept everything about me, whether you agree with it or not, you know. And for for people to start to call him an American hero, but only look at his accolades when it came to to his sport, and try to separate their, you know, separate his blackness from him, how could I take that serious? And that's exactly I mean, what the problem is. Exactly. They're doing the same thing with Jesse Owens. You got the movie floating out there, and they got the little famous quote that gets repeated. It ain't no, it, it ain't no black. It ain't no white. It's just fast and slow. Come on. Right. We know damn well why Jesse Owens was going through it. It wasn't because he was colorless. <laughs> Them right. Germans wanted to embarrass a nigga. Let's stop playing. Mm-hmm. Mm-mm-mm. And they could, did the same thing they, with uh, Jackie Will, Jackie Robinson. Same thing. Mm-hmm. Word. Word and like I said, they keep doing that too. Like I go back to King because I, I see it coming right now. With King, they just what they what do they um play? We hear Martin Luther King die. I have a dream speech, right? They don't play right. mm-hmm. nineteen sixty eight Martin Luther King. They don't they don't play nineteen sixty seven nineteen sixty eight Martin <laughs> Luther King whole, when he was going. That was a whole when other was, man. <laughs> that was a whole nother man. That's when he was talking right. about reparations. That's when he was talking about, we did a show about this last year, where he was talking about he could understand why some of the younger black people was mad at him because he might actually let them led them in the wrong direction. King was actually saying stuff like this in his later years. Exactly. And he got like yes, he did. way, mm-hmm. yeah, he got way more uh, what people would consider radical in his last years. He was going in on the war in Vietnam, going in on it, you know. He was talking about um, he was talking about poor people in general. Make no mistakes about it. King was talking specifically about black people too, and that's where they leave out. They just have I, I hate what they did with Martin Luther King legacy. They what they did with Martin Luther King legacy is so bad. You got smart black people that actually think he was a punk, you know, and kind of disrespect right. him too because they don't even know King for history. You know what I'm saying? So. It, it's right. that. I don't want to see this happen with Muhammad Ali either. So it's going to be up to us as a whole and community to make sure that they tell the full story with Muhammad Ali because right now they're telling, oh, he was good friends with Howard Cosell. Okay. I have no problem with that, but don't say that 
race he was he was raceless or you know religionless because one of the reasons why he didn't go to Vietnam was because of the nation of Islam his philosophy exactly I mean that's the real I know they don't like the nation of Islam and you know you could think whatever you want to think about it that's not the issue but that was part of the reason why he didn't go to Vietnam was he because you know religious beliefs you know, so I guess that leads me to another discussion. Well, before I do that, um, do y'all have anything else y'all want to add to that particular part of Muhammad Ali discussion? Uh, man, I could talk all day about this. I'm so disgusted with it. I mean, that was our hero. He, mm-hmm. um, I mean, I wasn't even alive at that time, but just hearing the story, that you know what that does to a young black child to recognize somebody who sacrificed everything, you know, mm-hmm. and told the U.S. government pretty much to go to hell, mm-hmm. you know, on the on the basis of his beliefs, on the basis of peace, basically, because he don't want to go to war. Mm-hmm. That 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 is that's inspirational to to young black people. So I mean, word, yeah. Word. Miss Baba, did you have anything else to add on this part of the discussion? Um, no, you can go on. Okay. Um, my last thing I'm going to add is this. Um, I respect Muhammad Ali so much for this, and I just want to tie this into the Hillary Clinton discussion. Now, you have Bill Clinton giving the eulogy for Muhammad Ali, and his wife is was responsible for lowering the minimum wage in Haiti, a black nation. And you know Muhammad Ali was a, all about black people. So just a slap in the face, just a complete slap in the face. Muhammad Ali went to jail for refusing to go to war. Hillary Clinton started wars. She overthrows governments. Like, so mm-hmm. it's just ironic that they have this man given the eulogy. It's like everything that Ali stood against. They gonna get somebody that stood that stood for what he stood against to give his eulogy. I mean, how damn good? How how disrespectful can you get? I, I'm going. I was right. trying not to curse too, but it's just super disrespectful. Super disrespectful. Ed. I don't know. I don't want to talk about the family because I don't. I don't know, but it just like I wish the family wouldn't have did that. You know, I I just I just wish they wouldn't have, wouldn't have did that. And I'm sick of the Clintons. It's not just the Clintons. It's a lot of other people that take advantage of us like this. But you know, Hillary Clinton running around with Trayvon Martin mother. You know, ru- running around with Eric Gardner's wife. And it's just using black people, man. Doing the nay nay hot sauce in the purse, man. It just it just disgusts it, it disgusts me. And I think I'm more disgusted at us for fall, for falling for this. But you know, it I can't be mad at my people too much because it's kind of how some of us was conditioned, and we just got to work to break that conditioning. So I'm I'm gonna leave it at that. Right. Let me just jump it's in. Right failure right. of leadership. I just want yeah, real quick. It's the mm-hmm. failure of leadership. And it's not respecting proud black people. And I'm going to say it because it, it has to be said. It's the same thing that happened during the Million Man March. I don't understand what is the the um, the notion now that we have to suppress proud black, strong black. You know what I mean? Why do we have to suppress that now? But then we'll turn around and we'll talk about freedom. How free can you be? If you can't be proud to be who you are, or well, you go turn a million man march into a love fest, and now you got one of our greats going, going and transitioning, and you bringing up Bill Clinton, Bill Clinton, mm. and, yeah. and what's the other guy named who like to do the little Muhammad Ali impersonation, uh, Billy Crystal, whatever his name is. Ugh. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, let's let's just have you know, let's just bring them make it a whole damn service, right? Okay, that's what's up. All right. Yeah, my my as well. I I I keep going. I'm gonna leave it alone. All right. 
What? Well, I want to. No, oh, did you want to say something else, Miss Bala? Um, lastly, yeah, quick. I just wanted to um, expound on, upon something that you said, too, because I wanted to set the record straight so no one can get our words um, minced up or twisted in any way. Because as you, as we continue our conversations, we we continue to speak of Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton, almost as if they're one and the same. Now, I don't, I don't generally think, and I don't think my co-hosts um, generally um, subscribe to the idea that uh, one spouse should be held accountable for the other spouse's actions. But in this particular case, we're we're saying things, and um, we're saying things to make it seem that way because of the fact that they both support each other. Like they're, they are one in the same in this, in this situation. They are one in right. the same. They, they back each other up. They both are very conniving and, and like snakes in the grass, you know? So, mm-hmm. yeah. So in this, in this particular situation, it is very fitting to do so because of the fact that they both support each other. Well, I could just yeah. go in on Bill Clinton without even bringing in Hillary. It's so much. Th- we don't even got time to go in on Bill Clinton <laughs> the way we really need to. I mean, let's just talk about the original M- Million Man March. Bill Clinton was against the original Million Man March. You know, yes, he was. and preach it. He really, he really was. He he absolutely shit it on the Million Man March. Go like you just look up Bill Clinton's statements on the Million Man March around that time. Just look it up. Mm. And like I said, whether you like the Nation of Islam or not, this is what really brought Muhammad Ali into consciousness. Not saying he wasn't conscious before that, but that was a big part of who Muhammad Ali was, even though he transitioned to more orthodox Islam later on in his life. You know, mm. regardless of what it is, it, the Million Man March to me, not even really about the Nation of Islam. It was about you know, just getting black men together to do for the communities. Just because, you know, I don't uh, I don't really agree with the religious aspects of the Nation of Islam, but I respect the brothers. Right. You know? Exactly. So, so that's, that's what it is. So, I, I we can go all the way in on Bill Clinton. We can talk about Rwanda. We could talk about a whole bunch of stuff with them. We could talk about the Clinton Foundation, the Clinton Global Initiative. Oh, we could go all the way there, but you know that's not what this show is for, you know. So um, <laughs> we can go on both of them. It, it's so much dirt with them when it comes to black people. It, it, it's just crazy. So anyway, but what I want to ask man y'all picks up a damn sack and we just support them. <laughs> Move it along. Word. Plays a damn Word. sack and we just say, "Oh, look, look at old Slick Willie." Move it along. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and. I want to ask y'all this, and I want to ask the audience to ask themselves this, and be honest too. Like one of the one of the problems is, I think sometimes people have a hard time being honest with themselves. Like, okay, would you have done what Muhammad Ali have done? And don't we have to be the same situation? Just make a decision that just went against your principles. Um. But you stood for it. Like, let me rephrase that. Would you stand on principle if it would hurt you significantly? Because like Mikhail said, Muhammad Ali went broke off of what he did. He went to jail off of what he did. He lost the prime of his career off of what he did. But he stood for his principles. I don't know how many people will really do that. And have there been times in your life when you did that? And have it been times in your life where you went in the opposite direction of that? And where you at right now in your life, what would you do if a situation like that presented itself? You know, I think it's a hard question to answer. And like, because it's easy to say, oh, yeah, I would have did that. I would have did that. But we we know that a lot of people wouldn't know. <laughs> you know, so I want to I, I wanna start off with asking you, Miss Baba, what, what do you think about that? Well, I'll say this first. Muhammad Ali was really the greatest. And the reason why I say that is because I do believe in the theory of to, to like, who much is given, much is required, right? 
So he he reached a certain level of success, and he used that as his platform to speak out against um, civil injustice. And the reason why it's it's so big and it's it's so um, noteworthy is because of the fact that when he was doing this during the civil rights movement, you have to remember the climate of the climate of our. Um, of our society, of America at that time, you know, th- he he argued with with um, white students. He argued and and spoke his views very public, very publicly in a in a very unapologetically black manner. And that was at a time when doing so would have gotten gotten him killed just for expressing his viewpoints. You know, so yeah, that's very that's very commendable, and that's something that I don't know if I would have had the much as much go as he had to do so. I I would I would definitely hope so. I want to say that I would, but I really don't know if I would be willing to put my life on the line and be courageous enough to stand up for my people. Meanwhile, that could have been my death sentence. I I don't know. I don't know. Um, what I can attest to is different things that I've done in my own lifetime, and mind you, it's nowhere near um, that le- level of um, of gravity. But I will say that there are several occasions, several instances, um, where I was met with complete disrespect um, as it pertains to as it pertains to just, you know, inequality, I should say. And most of the situations came about in in my younger years. I don't really, I don't typically see things now that I'm older um, personally, but when I was growing up, because I know I've stated on the air of quite a few times that for high school I went to a predominantly Caucasian high school. So, um and this, I swear to God, when I moved to this area, it was like in the 2000s, I, it was upstate New York, I literally thought that I was brought back into the 1960s. Like, it was it was very, very odd, very weird. Um, but um, during those times, there were certain, I, for instance, here's one example. I started a job, it was a little, a little rinky-dink job, and I was working at the movie theater. And if anyone knows my actual government name, Jamie Hall, is very, very bland. I might as well be named Jane Doe. So on my resume, you'll see my resume. All you'll see is my name and, you know, whatever information I I provide. So no one knows what to expect. Or at least, in my opinion, I think most people expect a white boy because that's what the name sounds like, right? So then... They'll call, they called me um, for a phone interview. And on the phone, I guess at that point, he knew that I was at least a female, but he may have um, assumed that I was white because a lot of people, especially back then, a lot of people said that I sounded white, whatever that means. So, um, so yeah, I come into the interview, and it was a great interview, and he actually told me that, and I, I was a teenager at this time, but he actually told me that that was one of his, his best interviews he's, he's ever had. And at the, and he would say, you know, things like, oh, you're so intelligent and well-spoken mm-hmm. and all this, that, and the third or whatever the case is. And I'm like, oh, okay, I'm just eating it up, thinking like, oh, I did great. And then not too long after, I realized just the dynamics and the, the culture of the position and it just seemed very, um, I'll put it nicely and just say it didn't seem welcoming to anyone of our, of our um, blackness. But um, so I was wondering, you know, if there was any other black people that ever worked there. And I asked one of my coworkers and they said, oh, you know, you're probably the first one that I've seen. And honestly, I was surprised. So then I brought the supervisor into this conversation because I wanted to know what he what his thoughts were, and he told me straight to my face that if he would have known that I was black, he wouldn't have even called me in for an interview. And wow. I was I was blown away, number one. Number two, I wasn't really on, like, the conscious tip or whatever, but at the end of the day, I was still a black person. So you feel some type of way. 
and I didn't really have anyone to really talk to about the situation. So in in that moment, what I did was I just had to give her my two cents. At that point, I feel like you crossed the line and it turns into a disrespect. And because of that, I let him have it. I gave him some choice words, but he had nothing to do. He had nothing to say to it. And I'm at the time I was very grateful because I was still able to keep my job. But I don't I don't tolerate any of that stuff, you know. So I let him know in a very disrespectful manner that that's not okay. And for him to hold these these sentiments of oh black people are you know this way, and then I choose I show you otherwise. That doesn't make me an exception. I don't. I'm not an exception, and that's one thing I hate. I hate to see when any black person does something great, people look at that as the exception, like they're one out of a million. No, that's not the truth. They don't know, and that's not a fact. There's a lot of us out here just, you know, doing things, doing great things, but for whatever reason, there's still this negative portrait painted out there, and a lot of people decide to. Um, believe in that in those sentiments, but that's not true at all. So it's just like little things like that, and I could go on and on about all the different um, scenarios and situations. But anytime there's ever a situation where you yourself personally know that um, whether whether they say it blatantly or it's done um, covertly, I think it's important to number one just say something at the very least open your mouth and, and talk. But, yeah, that's me. All right. Same question to you, Mikhail. Um, I'm going to give a very layered answer, but I'm, try- I'm going to try to uh, uh, condense it so I'm not, you know, uh, speaking too long on it. But for, in in regards to would would I myself personally – do as Muhammad Ali did. I have done what Muhammad Ali has done on a micro level. You know, uh, I was employed by these uh, this uh, church. Actually, it was a church ran by some white people. Uh, and I was employed with them. I was there for a while, actually. Um, I, but I, I was always working in like the garages and the in the yards and stuff like that. So I was kind of away from from the actual people when I was there, it wasn't like it was like service or nothing like that. It's during the week or whatever. But um, one day they wanted us all to go into the basement and clear the basement out. I should have known something was funny about the place because when I went down into the basement, bro, sister, I'm telling you, I walked right into Bamboozle. It was so many. I really wish we had phones back then that could take pictures. It was so many uh these black gals with these big old eyes and big lips. I'm serious. It was crazy. Oh, I thought I walked. Yeah, like Tiffany. Yeah, and they had this stuff. Yeah, they had this stuff like all over the basement. I'm like, man, what the hell? So anyway, oh, hell what no. I inquired about is I'm like, what is what is all this down here? You know, and, and they just kind of laughed it off and walked away when I when they asked about it. And then I went, as I went upstairs to kind of talk to the uh, the uh, the father or whatever he was you know, the dows and everything, like, where did all this stuff come from? And that, don't y'all think that's a little disrespectful? And he just basically put it to me like this, you know, you, you're supposed to just do your job and not say anything or you won't have a job, basically. And so I, at that particular point, got my coat and I walked away from the job. I left. And they never saw me again. And they called me back. And I did not go back. Because I guess it was always something in me that had that fire. But I do also, that's one side of it. Um, but the other side of it for me is I don't think we have to do with Muhammad Ali in this day and age. I always give credit to our people that they did certain things to a lot of certain rights and privileges as their ancestors that we wouldn't have to make those same kind of sacrifices. We'll have to make different kind of sacrifices. So for me, I'm, I, I say that like the athletes of the day, they pulled the question and always talked about um, what athlete would stand up like my, look, all due respect to some of these athletes, I don't want half of them talking like Muhammad Ali because half of them don't have the intelligence of Muhammad Ali. You got to understand, Muhammad Ali went through the NOI, 
I mean the FOI, excuse me, he was FOI, Fruit of Islam. These are disciplined brothers. These are people who study. They have syllabus of books and, 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 and prerequisites and um, all these things they have to read and they have to get up a certain time and pray. And that was the thing that built Muhammad Ali up to a person that could go out and speak to the public and speak on certain issues and know how to deal with the media. Man, these Negroes ain't never, they damn near barely ain't past high school. You want them speaking on some social issues? <laughs> I don't want them saying a damn thing. And, and, and that'd be the thing with us because we, we hold this standard for Ali, but we got to understand where these other brothers are coming from. They don't have that intelligence. They don't have that. Uh, they haven't read those kind of books. They don't know what's going on like that. I don't want these Negroes to say nothing because all they're going to do is find themselves on the cone train. Or they are, they are in positions where um, they can lose a lot. You know what I mean? And is the community going to step up to make sure they stay okay? That's what I alluded to when I talked about Ali before because he lost so much, but the community wasn't there to help him sustain himself a certain way. I mean, it was other other rich entertainers that kind of helped them, you know, stay afloat. But my, my point is, if LeBron James comes out like everybody wanted him to do with the um, with the um, uh, Tamir Rice situation, okay, he does this. He says, "I ain't playing until they get something right in Cleveland." Okay, that's cool. Now he's gonna lose his endorsement with Nike. He's going to lose his endorsements with uh, Gatorade. He's going to lose his endorsement with all these other places that give him hundreds of millions of dollars. Now, is the community going to step up and make sure he's okay when he does that? Or is everybody going to say, way to go, LeBron, and then leave him out there broke as hell, and then 10 years from now, it's a 30, or 30 for 30 on LeBron James, or how he was once one of the most richest people in America, and then now he broke somewhere, in a, in a, broke somewhere strong out, because he made that sacrifice. See, we got to be ready to take, we got to be ready to, as a community to stand up for those people if they're going to make them kind of sacrifices. Now, we can do certain things on a personal level because if we fall, our fall ain't that, 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 um, that, our fall ain't that uh, long to the ground. But if they fall, they take taking a long fall to the ground. So before we ask these entertainers to do so, we got to be ready to step up for them. Uh, I know that's a, a popular answer, but it's the truth. You know, it's the truth. We got, and then, and then, and the thing I just said before, I don't want most of them talking because most of them don't got no damn sense, no way. And I ain't saying it in no arrogant way, but have we seen some of these people in interviews? I don't want them speaking on black issues. I don't want them speaking about what we need to do. I want people qualified to speak on that stuff. People that study, people who discipline themselves, people who really get involved with the issue. When LeBron said, "I don't really know about the case, so I'm not gonna speak about it," that was the best damn answer he ever gave. Because he get out there and start talking some old stuff, and the next thing you know, he out there cold. Entire answer to that entire I don't really want most of these people to be Ali. I want them to stay in their lane and let those who are educated enough become Ali. Okay. Uh, I'm going to ask you this. Did you see your boy Stephen A today? Yeah, I saw him today. Okay. Did you, or was it yesterday when he spoke on Ali? Um because I'm interested to hear what you think about what he said. Like, what he said, what Stephen A. said, I didn't mind too much. But there there was one part of what he said where I think he left out some details. And I think <laughs> I think it's just, like, projection. You can't really – you don't know what Muhammad Ali would have did in today's in – to, in today, in this setting – because he said that, you know, of course, he brought up Chicago, where you from, about all the shootings there. Right. He was like, you know, Muhammad Ali was here today and in his prime. He would have went to Chicago, block himself, and have people um, follow him and ask him what is going on here. I'm like, first of all, uh, I'll go back to this Abordo Technique line. Uh, Abordo Technique is an underground hip-hop artist. For those you don't know, no. And one of his saws, he was just like, he was like, I hate when I hate what people say, what Pac would say. You don't know shit about dead man perspective. So, I kind of, I always, I, I apply that to this case too. It's hard to say in this today's day and age, Muhammad Ali without Parkinson, what he would have did or what he would have said about Chicago. That's that's one thing. That's first of all. Secondly. 
maybe he would have did that, but maybe he actually would have talked about how it ended up like that in the first place and not just the typical um, top layer argument that we typically hear about all the shootings. Maybe he would have talked about, you know, how it got there, the northern ghettos from back in the day, how it potentially put there. Uh, he might have talked about the lack of economic opportunity, and he might have talked about government felons in the inner city overall as well. So I don't know. I just wanted, wanted to ask you, what did you think about Stephen A. Smith's statements? Um, from what I heard, I, I – primarily agree with a lot of what he said. He talked about the mm-hmm. positions that these youngsters are in, and it kind of echoed a little bit what I just did. Um, right. the, the climate was different, and uh, now, you know, corporate America gets in on our young brothers very early, mm-hmm. you know. So for them to be aware enough to speak on these certain issues, a lot of these young brothers, man, they, they get brought, they got the white agents, the white accountants, the white uh, everything all around them And from an early age They already telling them You're going to have to let your friends go You're going to have to let those people From your neighborhood go I know you got loyalty to them But if you want to be successful Then you have to And they get ran this stuff You know in their head Early and often You know from from an early age on up So many of It, it becomes kind of uh, amazing When you actually do see A LeBron James Who will put a, uh, a hoodie on Or wear a, a shirt uh, dedicated to the Eric Gardner situation or say something uh, like he did on the Tamir Rice situation. You know, it's pretty much a miracle because he's been a child prodigy being watched by scouts since he was, I think, what, eighth grade or something like that? So, I mean, from that perspective, I do agree with um, Stephen A. Smith. Uh, the part that I don't agree with is um, like you said about that was centered around the Chicago situation. What Ali might do, you know, you got to remember he was a he was a Muslim. But I mean, even more so, it, it gives a a a, a, a false uh, projection that there was there wasn't any gang violence or anything like that back in the '60s when it was. In fact, a lot of it. In fact, when you go into looking at the numbers, the actual numbers, there were times in the '60s and the '70s there was more killing from gang violence then than they got now in Chicago, you know? So um, that he would have dealt with it the exact same way the nation deals with it now. And, again, as, as you just said, he probably would have talked about how these things came about in the first place, you know? But um, yeah. I, I'm not going to put Stephen A. on the coon train this time. I, 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 I guess he was okay today. No, nah, he wasn't what I cooning. He was okay. No, he wasn't cooning. Um, and I know we get on Stephen A. a lot. He's been decent lately, actually. But I I don't like that. Sometimes you good, sometimes you not thing what he what he does. So lately he haven't really been cooning. I kind of just disagreed a little bit with his statement, but overall his statement wasn't really too disrespectful or too bad. But um, right. back to the original um, question. That I was asking. I guess I'll answer the question as well. I would like to think I would have did what Ali did. I know I would have um, said some stuff because um, I, I, I just give a few examples right now. Just always for black. Uh, sometimes when I tell people about what we do here, they ask me why would I name it that because I'm living it in my market right there off the top. So mm-hmm. just name it. Yeah a business always for black, we kind of limited it, limited in, you know, the audience we can reach. And some the topics that we talk about, we limit it on how far we can reach or who we can reach just because of the name itself. That's what, you know, that's what a lot of people tell me. And I say, okay, I'm fine with that. <laughs> you know, that is it, it's all well and good. Because um, the reason why we started this was because people was afraid to have something strictly for black people. And I won't even say strictly for black people because anybody in any nationality can listen to this because I think we have thoughtful, provoking discussions. But 
I want to say that we are definitely proud of our heritage and proud of black people. And we need, and we have specific issues that need to be solved and we shouldn't be afraid to say that. And right now it's too much like intersectionality right now where everybody want to lump everything together and a lot of different groups have different issues that they need to work on, but we do as well. And we need to focus on those issues. So as far as that on that level, that's a that's a very, very small example and that doesn't even measure at all to what Ali did, but that's just one example. Um there's been times at my job too, at jobs, um, where I had to stood up. I I'll tell you this one little story. When I was um active duty military, we was in a Middle East country. It wasn't a war country. It wasn't Iraq or Afghanistan, but I was in a Middle Eastern um, country. I mean, it was hot there, man. Like, it'd be like 125 degrees or whatever. So, I had a job where we was, like, searching vehicles that came in or whatever for, like, explosives or whatever, right? So, um, if you worked at the, the night shift, it was a little bit better because it was cooler. So, but we had, like, some some people there that was somehow the subject of the riots came up. And before I even get to that part, I used to come to work um, this in the military with like black books. And like, it's funny when people ask me what I was reading, I just showed them the cover and they'd be like, Oh, Oh my God. Why are you reading that? So I had a whole bunch of my uh, books I was reading at the <laughs> time. And I gave a, f- yeah, I really gave a fuck less. <laughs> about them um uh, it's funny like other like some of the other black people called me like um young fire con and shit when i was there so <laughs> w- which was kind of funny it was kind of funny to me but anyway uh, somehow the discussions of the la riots got brought up because i think dude was a was a former cop or something and and he was of course he was just like oh the people in la was just so wrong and all that other stuff well i checked them yeah i checked them so hard like he was he was like, you ever heard the word flabbergasted? That's literally what happened. Yep. He was higher rank. He was higher rank than me. He could barely talk after that. Like he couldn't even get that out his words, and I gave a fuck less. So, basically, like a couple days later, I got moved from my position and got put in the daytime, the hot ass sun. <laughs> I guess to mm-hmm. teach me a lesson. So, like, they could really fire me, but they was like, ah, right, yo, he's. He's talking too much shit. Let's get him off this position. Let's give him like a shitty position for the next few months. So that's what happened. I was like, okay, it is what it is. You know, I used to check people while I was in the active duty military all the time. I used to check people all the time for saying stupid stuff. Like all the time. I used to look forward to checking them while I was younger. But now I'm like, uh, it doesn't really do nothing because it's not really changing their mind. You know, I say I'm just want to focus on what our people really have to do. So I guess those small examples and some can argue that's not even really an example because, you know, just being in the military itself, people could say, OK, if you're in the military itself, that's something that you need to look at. You know what I'm saying? So I can understand that point of view, too. And I would I would respect that if people said that as well. But um, I definitely um, in my opinion, have stood up and basically basically it was to my detriment, not to my benefit at times to do some of the stuff I did. Now what I went to the level right. would I have gone to the level of Muhammad Ali? I would like to think so, but to tell you the truth, there's no way I could say I would unless I was actually in that situation. I would like to say yes, but I I don't know. I would hope so. I would definitely hope so. You know what I'm saying? And so far, you know, at a smaller level, I have. So that's the only thing I can really say. So before we get out of here, um, anybody else have anything to add? Ms. Baba, you got any closing comments? Yeah. um, I did want to touch on the psychology of symbolism because during the time of um, Muhammad Ali's heyday, I should, I'll call it, you have to remember that even though, you know, he must have felt felt some type of way because of the fact that he's, he had reached so many accolades 
And a lot of people looked at him like, oh, he was the greatest. But then meanwhile, when he came back, you know, um, the reality, his reality was, you know, on a day-to-day basis, he would see things that proved to him that he was a second-class citizen. You know, he lived in the, he grew up in the segregated South. So seeing those things and, and then on top of that, being in the midst of the civil rights movement, um, forming bonds with um, with Malcolm X, Martin Luther King um, Jr., those type of things will, will, and I think may have been the catalyst for why he was able to to stand out and, you know, stand up and say the things that he said. Um, so, yeah, it would be different compared to today's world because we see, you know, as you as we were saying earlier, there's so much symbolism that makes us feel like it's not a direct threat to you. You know, it doesn't, it may not touch you directly or on a regular basis, but still, there's still a, a huge problem in our society. It's just the fact that, you know, a lot of times you may not witness something or experience something firsthand. So it's kind of like you're, like you support it, but you're detached from it at the same time. And I'll leave yeah. it there. Or Mikhail? I mean, I would just say that um, my last thoughts on Ali is um, these are the things that make me proud to be who I am. You know, mm-hmm. uh, he was inspirational, and that um, you know, we it's on us to make sure that their legacy doesn't become mud, you know, and trash. It's on us to make sure that um, what they stood for reigns over the propaganda, because I'm sure that um, Ali's name being and name and his um, being sold. These people are trying to clean it up so they can begin to sell him and earn money off his legacy. Um, so they're gonna they're gonna be working. So it's on us to make sure that we we keep his legacy alive as well as our other greats. You know, don't just talk about Prince Purple Rain. Talk about his war he had with the music music industry. Same thing for Michael Jackson. Same thing for uh, Martin Luther King. Same thing for Malcolm X. Same thing for Harriet Tubman. You know, um, soon they're gonna be doing a Nat Turner film. Um, we it's on us to 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 talk about the uh, warrior spirit of Nat Turner as they try to make him more softer and more humanitarian through his Christian religion. You know, it's on us to make sure we uh, keep their legacies alive.